Hey folks, Michael Mann from Michael Mann Security Services. Welcome to Behavior and Threat Detection Me uh, Methods in Prevention. Uh, as our friends are jumping on, uh, as always, as folks are kind of jumping in and joining us late because we're right at the hour, uh, let me go over our admin stuff. So we'll talk about contact info and our upcoming events. We've got a busy uh, next uh, six weeks. So you can get us at michaelmansecurityservices.com. That's our website. You can send us an email at either contact at michaelmansecurityservices.com or at scott m at michaelmansecurityservices.com. You can call us at 615-606-1006 at Scott, or you can always get us on Facebook or Instagram, Instagram at Safe with Man. All right. Uh, this is a uh, in-person course. This is Enhanced Concealed Carry. Friday, September the 11th in Brentwood, Tennessee from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. It is a non-firing course, but we're going to do a lot of manipulation with weapons. And so I'll be supplying all snap caps, inert guns, airsoft, all that good stuff. So I'm going to go over stuff. So if you've got a carry permit uh, and you're not comfortable with guns, which most people in the go to carry permit class are not, because it's not all about shooting. Uh, the carry permit class is most of the time about when and where you can carry the gun. So this gets into without having to spend a lot of money on ammo because ammo is expensive right now. This gets into weapon manipulation, equipment selection, use of force options, de-escalation, presentation for concealment, and then the most important part is this movement stuff inside your home, self-defense inside your home, target engagement procedures, all that good stuff. So 75 bucks, 5 to 9 p.m. this Friday, Brentwood, Tennessee. Uh, several people signed up. I think we've got two or three slots left open. Uh, and we hope to see you Friday if you're here in Middle Tennessee within driving distance. Good class. You don't want to miss it. Again, especially the last part, we're going to be doing uh, how to clear your home if you had to leave your safe haven upstairs or wherever you're at or wherever your safe haven in your home is. So we'll talk about what that is, how to build one, and then if you have to leave it and get to your family uh, and try to rescue or save them, what does that look like, how you do it, and there'll be a little force on force at the end. So you'll like it if you're going to be able to come to it. All right, uh, Sunday, September 27th. Uh, Israeli Security Concept 2, Field Threat Assessment. So we had a group take uh, Level 1 again uh, earlier last month. Yeah, this is September. So yeah, earlier last month. Uh, this will be uh, Part 2 of that. So if you took uh, Part 1, we've got Part 2 on the 27th, 1 to 4.35 p.m., uh, somewhere around there. It's about four hours, about a four-hour class, three after four hours. It is a virtual instructor-led training session, so that's going to be me with you uh, on a computer. So you don't have to be – you can be anywhere from that. And we thank all the folks from Colorado and New York and everybody that jumped in from last time. Hope to see you on the 27th. Uh, that's 60 bucks. That's, uh, again, uh, Level 2. Prerequisite, you have to have level one to understand level two because it's a continuation of the process of conducting those field threat assessments. All right, uh, this Sunday, September 13th, 1 to 5 p.m., uh, Brentwood, Tennessee, again, armed vehicle defense, like enhanced concealed carry, non-firing, but you're going to be doing a lot of stuff in and around your cars. So I'll teach you the process of carry options in the cars, uh, safety and presentation in confined spaces, ballistics when we talk about uh, bullets on cars, uh, use and cover concealment in and around the, ba uh, in and around the uh, vehicle or car, uh, basic fighting techniques inside and outside, your target engagement procedures, what that looks like, uh, movement in and around the car, protecting a passenger or third party, and there's some reality-based training scenarios at the end, same thing. Uh, there'll be some force-on-force -force stuff uh, at the very last, all right? Okay, uh, another uh, virtual instructor-led uh, training process or program, that's going to be Tuesday, October the 6th, okay? Uh, that is going to be, I don't know why the 11th's there, it's going to be uh, October 6th. That is going to be Serving the Church, a Primer for Church Security Ministries. That is going to be right here from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Again, just log in through Facebook. That is a uh, preferred content or preferred event. This is 20 bucks. Here's what we're going to cover. So we do a lot of advanced stuff here, a lot of advanced topics, overviews. But we do get a lot of questions about, hey, I'm just starting. I don't, know, I don't know how to start a church security ministry. And I've now taken this on as a volunteer. What does that mean? So we're going to talk about like developing your mission statement. That's, a, that's important for a lot of churches. So we're going to tell you how to do that. Uh, how to communicate the need for security to your leadership, to church leadership. Uh, using volunteers to safeguard the church, what that means from a legal standpoint and just from a resource standpoint. How to recruit and retain. Retain is the most important part, folks. Uh, how we've been very successful at that in a couple of churches. So I'll walk you through that process. We're going to get into standards. What should your standard look like? I get texts and emails every week asking the same questions. Like what firearms qualification course should we shoot? Should I? I mean, I've gotten stuff like... Uh, 
I think Scott, I think we've gotten stuff like, you know, should they take a PT test? Uh, so we've got, it's like all over the board. And so I'm going to get into their volunteers, what works, um, the role of law enforcement, and then we'll get into the introduction to uh, the Israeli security concept, or really it's that behavioral uh, threat detection process, which we're going to talk about today. And then the most important thing, how you make this a ministry. And so it is. So it's uh, serving the church, a primer for security ministries. We're going to teach you for 20 bucks in two hours how to set that, uh, set, how to set that up and what that's going to look like. Okay. And you can do that from the comfort of your own home and your jammies with your hair all up and sweaty and nasty, however you want to do that. We won't be watching you, okay? I mean, if you want, you, if you want to get on the camera, you can, but you don't have to. All right, uh, uh, October the 9th, Friday, uh, Urban Rifle, Introduction to Personal Defense. If you know anything about the modern technique and you know about Urban Rifle, this is uh, Clint Smith is uh, uh, the guy that uh, really... Uh, developed the first urban rifle program back in the 80s. Back then, I remember he told me that he couldn't give it away, I and mean, he talks about that in some of his articles. Uh, so this is another non-firing event. Uh, you will need to have a rifle, like with enhanced concealed carry, you're going to need a pistol. Same thing with uh, vehicle defense. But you need, will need a rifle. We're going to go over, like, equipment selection. We're going to go over the manipulation of the gun, which is the most important part of the urban rifle program because, again, you're probably not going to run out of ammo with 20, 27 rounds in the magazine because we don't load 30. You're going to learn all about that in the class. So we're going to, But you're going to probably do something to the rifle. So we talk, uh, teach all the manipulation, moving inside your house, storage, uh, ballistics, what that means inside your house with a carbine and what kind of ammo to use because it's much more preferable over a pistol or even a shotgun uh, and why that is. We're going to talk about that. Uh, and then we're going to get into that movement in the house, getting your family out. And then uh, with the inert rifles and airsoft rifles, we're going to do some force-on-force -force stuff after you learn how to move inside your house with that gun. Okay, So that's Friday, October the 9th in Brentwood, Tennessee, 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. Okay. All right. Just one last thing. So we're uh, moving the name because it fits with this. So uh, behavioral based threat detection module one, which is ISC or Israeli security concept module one. We're just changing the name because people get confused about what this is. That's really what this is. So behavioral based threat detection module one. We'll start that all over again. Sunday, October the 11th from 1 p.m. Uh, to 4.30 p.m. Again, it's a virtual instructor led training program. 60 bucks. You can do that from the comfort of your own home. And so, again, we're starting that process process in October. So every month we'll do a level one, we'll do a level two. October, we're starting all over again. And after this, some of you guys are going to be interested in it. Okay. All right. Questions, anything come up so far, Scott, on anything? Okay. All right, here we go. Let's talk about what's going to happen here in the next 30 minutes. All right. So we're going to provide an overview of behavioral threat detection techniques, why they are important, what it means. Uh, what does that mean to you in your worship or your house of worship? What does it mean for your mosque? What does it mean for your uh, synagogue? Or what does it mean for your business? Okay. And really, what does it mean for you like in the public when you're out looking at people every day? Uh, we're going to spend about 30 minutes. I've got 40 on here. We'll try to get, uh, try to get done on time. We're going to get into considerations, main three considerations we start talking about these behavioral and threat detection methods. All right. We're going to get into the history of it, where it kind of came from, especially the concept that we're talking about today. Um, uh, we'll uh, skip over the case study because we're running out of time to do that, but I'm going to really cover the case study in the elements. Okay. All right. So let's get into it. Let's talk about it. So considerations, number one. Uh, first consideration, let's talk about stopping the adversary. So last week we got into, if you listened to, or if you tuned in on use of force, I talked about, and this is, you know, I learned this years ago, uh, in the modern technique and somebody that I still go to that watches me five or six times a year, talks about this a lot and it's, and it's, uh, very applicable to us, uh, even in the prevention world. So two types of stops for adversaries. Number one, there's a physical stop. Now physical stop means I got to stop them with my hands, my feet, a stick, a baton, pepper spray, a gun, right? So that is a physical physical stop of a person. The second type of stop is a psychological stop. When we start talking about uh, prevention, prevention is about the use of a psychological stop. So we don't have to put our hands on them. We don't have to hit them with something. And, you know, God forbid, and thank goodness, we do not have to use deadly force or shoot them. There's all kinds of legal uh, uh, issues that go along with the use of deadly force. And so because of that, behavioral threat detection or these techniques teach you how to implement that psychological stop. And here's the cool thing about it. The psychological stop happens two weeks before the attack happens because that's what you're on there on post and you see these things. So when we start to talk about those stops or those types of stops, remember when we start to talk about risk. So there is a personal risk, number one, if you've got to physically stop somebody, there's a personal risk to you. You could get hurt. You could get killed. 
Number two, there is a risk to the church as a financial risk. There is a social risk. There is a personal risk. If, if you have to use deadly force, you're acting as a security team member or a volunteer on your church security team, your synagogue's team, your mosque's team, or it's your business. You're like armed security for a business. You have to do that. There is risk to you and the business, personal, professional, social, uh, liability issues, so financial. So you want to stay away from that. The psychological stop is the most important stop. And for houses of worship, we're talking about the mission. Our mission anyway is prevention. And so it's seeing this two weeks before it happens and psychologically or implementing that psychological stop or that ability to psychically, uh, psychologically uh, impact the adversary's motivation to attack what you're trying to protect. So when we talk about considerations, we talk about stopping the adversary, uh, the behavior and threat detection process focuses on the psychological stop or preventing the event from happening, uh, happening. Number two, get away from the gun and focus on your job. Let me say that one more time. This is the most important thing. I talk about this all the time. I get emails. I get texts. I get phone calls. Everybody wants to know about, like, what qualification course should we be shooting? What kind of pistol course should, should we, uh, or what kind of gun should we carry? Don't, man, throw the guns away for right now. When we talk about protection, protecting facilities, your job is to deter and to gather information. And that's what this is about. Get the guns out of your head. Learn how to prevent this before it happens. So when we start talking about risk, uh, especially when we talk about houses of worship, of an armed person coming into your congregation and shooting everyone, that risk is less than minimal. I've shared these statistics numerous times. From 2000 to 2019, or really 2004, because from 2000 to 2004, there were no attacks, active shooter attacks committed against houses of worship. 2004, 2019, 15 attacks. I've talked about this before. Over 350,000 Protestant churches in the United States of America. I'm not counting Catholic churches. I'm not talking about mosques. I'm not talking about synagogues. I'm not talking about the Mormons. I'm talking about just Protestant churches. So let's just say there's 850,000 houses of worship, which there may be more when we start to ta start talking about these other religions and faiths. And if that's the case, we had 15 from 2004 to 2019. It's less than minimal. The, the more probable event that's going to happen is someone having a heart attack, someone having a slip, trip, and fall incident, or someone coming and gathering intelligence on your house of worship, and you pick that up in the behavior and threat detection process. So I'm not saying don't deploy a gun, but stop thinking about the guns, number one. Stop doing that. Start thinking about prevention as a protection professional. And if I don't care if you're a volunteer, if you're standing post and you've got training and you're there to safeguard the people in that congregation, you are a security professional. There are some really smart young, young guys, nice guys, uh, in executive protection today. So executive protection is that close and personal protection. Uh, you know, I'm not a young guy anymore. Uh, when I was, I, was in my, I was in my late 30s, early 40s as I was getting leaving government security and getting into corporate security, I went to a lot of the older ex corporate executive protection schools, uh, EPI, Executive Protection Institute, ESI, Executive Security International, Open and Associates, and a bunch of government stuff too. There's three guys out there right now. Joe LaSorsa, who runs uh, his father's retired Secret Service agent. Uh, Joe, uh, you know, he's not little Joe. He's not because he's, not, he's, not, he's a big guy. But Joe's a Marine Corps combat veteran. Uh, Joe teaches uh, executive protection all the time in driving. If you look at Joe's stuff, he teaches shooting in his courses. But when you talk about EP, executive protection, he's teaching prevention. He's talking about the advance of the pre-planning. Aaron Malden from AS Solutions, another Marine Corps combat veteran, smart guy. There's a, you know, there's kind of a trend here, like the good-looking Marine Corps combat veterans, right? Yeah. So there's a trend here with these, uh, with these Marine Corps guys, and so uh, that are really smart and that can really show you something. And so Aaron Mall, another guy from AS Solutions, they teach, and he's got, I think, his own company too. They teach gun stuff, but the majority of what they're teaching to protect these high-risk clients or these people that have a lot of money is prevention. It's about seeing the attack before it happens. And then you've got Byron Rogers out of California, another Marine Corps combat veteran, good dude, really smart, leading the executive protection industry, same thing. He's got a, uh, he's got a podcast. He, does, he pushes out a lot of training virtually, uh, very EP specific. But again, they're talking about prevention. They teach gun stuff. They talk about it. They even do videos of shooting. But again, the focus is not the gun. Okay? Probability is going to be something else. All right? um, Troy, New York. 
Let's talk, take, uh, talk about that. Let's talk about a different attack. We always talk about active shooters. We talked about the Troy, New York attack, what, two weeks ago? So we gave you a, a detailed breakdown of the Baptist church that was attacked by a uh, left-wing organization, and it wasn't the attack that you think of. I'm going to go over here in just a second. So I'm going to let you see some of that video again, and we're going to come back to this slide. At no time in this situation was deadly force ever, uh, ever authorized. The security team members could have had guns, and they never would have been able to use them. And then I'm going to go over here in just a second why it is it's important for us to think about it. So watch this video again, and understand there's no, no point here ever during this attack, and it was an attack against the house of worship, where a deadly force was authorized. A gun wouldn't have done any good, but here's what would have worked. When they were conducting pre-attack surveillance on this church, because they did, to be able to do this and see that early and plan for it. Okay? Watch this. No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! No So blocking the sidewalk, doesn't, they don't want people to come in, they're using foul language. But no, no, at no point can deadly force be used here. So at no time would deadly force, and even you guys saw the video a couple weeks ago, we even have the video, I mean, Warren did that for us, where it broke down to where it was inside. You saw some, there was some shoving, but deadly force was never, never ever authorized in any time in this attack, ever. And so, again, get out of the gun, think about prevention. And here's what's important about this. We talked about this in left-wing terrorism. I talked about this. We talked about the history of left-wing terrorism. We talked about Marxism, where all this comes from. Uh, remember, when we start to start talking about this kind of attack, houses of worship are in danger. Remember Karl Marx, I told you this, he said this. So Karl Marx, the author, right, the founder of Marxism, right, the, the, the author of the Communist Manifesto, said very specifically, religion is the opium of mankind and all religion must be abolished. Why? Because it gives hope. And so that is a goal. The second goal of this, the, the folks you just saw to gain an audience from the media, from social media, from the public. Why? To get support. Number one, financial support. Number two, public support. So people come in to support them to say, yes, they're, that, we believe in what you're doing. Even if somebody doesn't want to do it, just to get everybody to believe that's right. And understand the cross, the Star of David, etc. All of that has always been offensive because of what it stands for and what it means. And as we go further down this path, I, I, don't, I don't think the world's going to end tomorrow. If the United States doesn't exist 10 years from now, it really means nothing to everybody else. It doesn't. Like, we've done a bunch of great things, but it really means nothing. The world will continue. But if we start to talk about, uh, you know, as we start to talk about the threat, this is a threat to houses of worship. And gaining an audience in the public, videoing all this, to, to watch our reaction, which gets into the next step here, we start to talk about the goal of the adversary, the new adversary, is to get an overreaction. Remember, we talked about this. One of the goals or characteristics of, of left-wing terrorism, all terrorism, not only gain that audience, but to get an overreaction from the person that they are attacking, whether that's just a social attack like we're seeing now or even a physical attack. And with volunteer church security teams specifically, your, tra your abilities and your resources for training are very limited. Some of you don't have anything. You're out there uh, as a, with a servant's heart serving the church, uh, some of you with very little training and very little experience. And we're glad you're out there doing it, but the focus here is an overreaction, and at no time would deadly force be authorized. I hope at no point when this happens, because it's going to happen again, that somebody doesn't create that overreaction or it's caused and deadly force is used when it's not supposed to so stay away from the gun think about prevention number two what is the goal of our new adversary and our threat spectrum that we're seeing today because remember he said it religion must be abolished because it is the opium of the people it is a goal of the new adversary folks okay 
Okay, so let's, where does all this come from? So where are we going to be talking about here? So in uh, use of force last week, we talked about like an immediate threat. We talked about intent. We talked about capability. So we're still talking about that, but we're talking about seeing an attack that's going to happen like later on. So we talk about terrorist attacks, that planning cycle, or what we call the adversary attack methodology. That could be months or years. It could take two years or it could take six months. Uh, my research in, in houses of worship, it's very short. That cycle is short, within one to two weeks. And so the idea of this is seeing something, you know, that two weeks before, that one week before that attack occurs. So where does this, this methodology come from? So here's the deal. So we've talked about this before. If you've taken ISC one or, one or two or both from us, then you've seen some of this stuff before. So 1960s, 1970s, large number of uh, hijackings carried out by Palestinian terrorist organizations, very specifically against the Israelis. Uh, and so the Israelis started to uh, develop very stringent uh, airline security guidelines. Now, um, obviously, Palestinian terrorist organizations in the 1670s targeting the Israelis, so it's Arabs targeting the Israelis. So the Israelis figured out pretty quick, hey, when we've got folks coming on the plane, we probably need to pay attention to the Arabs. Okay, uh, And so as they did that, the Palestinians figured that out. So we go back to our left-wing terrorism uh, webinar back probably, what, three or four weeks ago. We start talking about a Red Army faction. So we did a detailed kind of breakdown of Red Army, Red Army faction. So Red Army faction supported Palestinian terrorist organizations because of the ideology. And so what happens? Palestinians say, you know what, they're, they're looking for us. They figured out what we look like, who we are. They're stopping them. Let's go get somebody that's not an Arab. Let's go to another terrorist organization. Let's recruit somebody else. And so they do. And so what happens, or what happened, initially, the Israelis were, they were profiling. Profiling means they were targeting people based on very specific characteristics. So race, it could be religion, it could be sex, it could be socioeconomic status. That's profiling. And so what happens, the Palestinians figure this out. They go to the Japanese Red Army faction because again, they're Asian. And they say, look, would you commit this attack? They agree to it because they support the Palestinian cause. They load up on a plane. Uh, back then, the security measures were very different, so they had weapons stored in actually in like guitar cases or uh, like uh, instrument cases. Once they landed at Lot Airport, which has now been Gurian, got out, go, go to get the ba uh, baggage, take the rifles, take the explosives out, uh, commit this horrible massacre. I think they killed 26 and injured 80. And then after that, the Israelis figured out that they needed to go to some kind of a different system. Uh, now, and when I studied this in Israel, they actually call it behavior pattern recognition. So it is behavior and threat detection. It is not about profiling. It is about behavior detection or what some of us call signature, what someone is doing, not what the color of their skin, not their sex. Because, number one, we start talking about the mission of the church. That's sacred anyway. Like being a male or female, that's sacred. That is provided, that's given by God, All right? The color of your skin is sacred because that is given by God himself. And so to look for that goes against the, as a threat, just specifically that, goes against the mission of our organization, the church, All right? Or the synagogue and, you know, or the mosque. And so this behavior detection fits into our threat assessment process. We're not looking, we're not profiling, we're not looking for skin color, we're not looking for religion, socioeconomic status, if they're male or female, we're looking for signature or behavior, very specific behavior. So they move, the Israelis move to what we call, what they now call behavior pattern recognition, or that's what they call it in 2011. Quick video, if you've had ISC before, you've seen the video before, just highlights the attack that happened in 72 at Light Airports. You can see this and why they switched to what they're doing now and what we teach in ISC and what we're talking about today. Picture this, three individuals board a flight with carry-on luggage. Upon arrival at their destination, as fellow passengers wait for their suitcases, chaos. Grenades and machine guns are pulled out of their carry-on bags and 26 people are killed. Could be the work of the Islamic State, only it wasn't. This attack took place long before the wave of airport attacks we've seen in recent years. It was in 1972 and it was carried out by Japanese terrorists, hired and trained by the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. The target? Israel's only international airport, and it's just a short drive away from our studios in Tel Aviv. <laughs> May 30th, 1972. Three members of the Japanese Red Army advocating for a global revolution 
arrive in Israel and head to baggage claim at Lod Airport. They pull out automatic weapons and grenades from their suitcases and launch an attack on innocent civilians. They kill 26 and wound over 71 people. It was the deadliest and most serious terror attack on an airport to date. It would have a major impact on airport security around the world. Kozo Okamoto is the only terrorist to survive. Wounded, he tries to escape, but is captured. The Red Army coordinated the attack with a popular front for the liberation of Palestine, who trained the Japanese terrorists in Lebanon. North Korea helped finance the attack. The uh, Patrick Arguello group, who have executed the various team operation at the Libya airport, uh, was carrying an operation which is a continuation of the FLP's operation. Three Japanese comrades were shooting in the arrival lounge while we had five Palestinian comrades shooting outside. Okamoto was judged in an Israeli court. He pled guilty and was sentenced to life in prison. His bizarre behavior in jail caused others to think he was schizophrenic. He requested conversion to Judaism and tried to circumcise himself with a nail clipper. Okamoto was released in 1985 as part of a prisoner exchange between Israel and Palestinian militant factions. After being freed from prison, Okamoto moved to Lebanon, where he converted to Islam. Okamoto was granted political asylum by the Lebanese government, rewarding him for having participated in missions of resistance against Israel. He stated that he feels proud when Palestinians come up to him on the street and congratulate him for his acts. Kozo Okamoto is still wanted by the Japanese government. Okay, so let's get into the elements of this. So just a quick video background of the Lot Airport attack uh, while the... Uh, uh, the Israeli security system shifted uh, from uh, this profile into more of the signature or what we call these behavior and threat detection methods. All right, so uh, let's talk about uh, the elements of this. So number one, we talk about behavior and threat detection. Uh, know your environment. So mission and culture. Uh, very specific for your houses of worship. Uh, so conflict avoidance. Remember, we have three basic physical security principles when we talk about physical protection of any facility. Uh, that's those concentric rings of protection. Uh, we also talk about physical protection system and those functions. And then we get into conflict avoidance, which means our physical protection system system or the way we do security doesn't conflict with the mission of the organization we're trying to protect. And so we start talking about conflict avoidance, really behavior and threat detection goes along perfectly with our mission when we protect our houses of worship. Now, uh, not only does it go along with the mission, but it goes along with the culture. So uh, I kind of had to learn this the hard way. Luckily, I worked around a lot of smart people. I left government. When I left the Department of Energy, government, nuclear, uh, from being, you know, uh, the high-speed SWAT guy to, uh, you know, the security guy that was over all these sites. When I went into the corporate uh, corporate world to do this, I didn't really know a whole lot about it. And so, again, luckily, I met some friends or a lot or a lot of people that were a lot smarter than I was, and they uh, they started to teach me kind of processes and things I need to learn about culture to to just get things done in a corporate world. Well, it's no different. The church or any organization uh, has a culture. And there's different types of culture, uh, depending on what kind of school or training you, you receive. But what I received was, or what I was always taught uh, by some of these folks who are a lot smarter than me, was uh, some of the different types of culture, like mercenary culture, where there's chain of command, everybody does what they're supposed to do. So that's kind of like a mercenary or like a military uh, style of culture or organization. Uh, there's fragmented, where people are kind of doing their own thing, so the mission is unclear. Uh, and then there's something called networked. And network is when... Uh, the people in the organization, uh, they're all that when they, they work together because they they uh, they um, believe themselves to be very good cl uh, friends, close friends, or almost like family. Uh, now the problem with that is is sometimes when you get in that kind of environment, uh, if there if someone practices what we call a questioning attitude. So something comes up because they, there's a problem and you question it. If it's to believe, and very easy sometimes that can be uh, believed to be conflict, then the organization strays away from it and things don't change or things are very slow to change. So a lot of, a lot of times that is the culture in a church because it's a faith-based organization. The people that work there are very close. And so as a security team member, especially if you're a volunteer, you're not part of the staff, and you come in and you've been put in this location, especially if you're a leader, the volunteer leader is not a security person. If it's a staff member from that church and they fit into that culture, 
this is something when we start talking about prevention the way that we do this actually fits into that culture it works but it fits and it also fits in because it's very soft and it's very pleasing uh, because when we start talking about uh, the way that we communicate with the people who we believe is an adversary and remember these when we're seeing this the folks aren't the adversary is not there to attack they're there gathering information so we start talking about uh, using different communication styles and when we start talking about communication styles, we're not using direct or authoritative. We go up to gather information to get information from somebody that sometimes may not be beneficial to them. What we're trying to do is convince them to give that to us in a very, very nice way. So the communication style that we're using is very persuasive, and that's taught in field threat assessments, part two of our SC, a behavioral and threat detection process. And so this goes along with the environment so you have to know your environment understand your environment i mean i just you know just kind of explain a big part of it to you so number one understand what it is and know it know what that means know what your communication styles look like so understand the environment that you're in and make sure uh, that whatever your physical protection system is fits into this and in for behavioral threat detection we talk about houses of worship it works perfectly now look the way that uh, i was taught to do this in israel or the way that we we sat up there and watched it and studied it you know we went to ben Gurion airport and watched it we watched it at border crossings we watched it in other locations um, and we've modified that somewhat uh, a little bit we still use some of the same techniques but it's to fit into what we're doing so uh, we're using uh, again very open and very friendly communication with people you know we're trying to persuade people of that are that persuasive type of communication because we're trying to gather information if it gets to the field threat assessment piece of the actual behavior and threat detection process okay number two it's always a layered approach this gets into our physical protection system and so i don't look i don't care about guns i mean look i run armed teams i'm a gun guy uh, you guys know I've been a student of Colonel Cooper's Modern Technique for 30 plus years. I teach that. I'm a practitioner. I'm a student. Uh, so look, I like weapons and I like to arm up church security teams or houses of worship teams. But that's not what's important. It's how we deploy our physical protection system. And so another portion of our element in behavioral threat detection is that layered approach. So concentric rings of protection. We have complementary systems uh, that are layered strategically throughout the protected environment. So if somebody, if, you, or if our BDO or behavioral detection officer, which that's not really what we're doing, but it's very similar, if he misses something in the parking lot, and then we have another BDO, we have our other church security team volunteer uh, at that middle layer, he's going to pick it up. So it's layered. It's complementary systems. At the same time, like if we don't know, we, we can't make a decision, we'll get into that, then what we also have is we have our contingency measures already set up because this person has to go through these various psychological checkpoints. Not a physical checkpoint, but a psychological checkpoint. Detection should always occur as far away from the asset as possible. So I should see behavior as far away of, uh, from the asset that I'm trying to protect as possible. So look, if everybody's in the sanctuary or the worship center, I want to see this behavior out in the parking lot. I want to see it as far away as possible. Keep that stop in the parking lot, whether it is a psychological stop, so I deter them based on the information I'm gathering and see me staying in post, or even if I have to do a physical stop, if I have to use force, do it in the parking lot when everybody else is outside. There's distance, which creates time. Time equals marksmanship. Marksmanship equals uh, getting the hits. Getting the hits equals winning the fight. Okay? It's an old Clint Smith uh, uh, saying, and, but it's true. And so if I can see in the parking lot, even if I have to conduct a physical stop of the adversary, it's better to do it then when everybody's safe inside. Uh, I've showed, I think I've shown this video or this was case study, not this particular video, in some other uh, webinars. This is an attack uh, on pa the Pamela Geller event several years back or a couple years back in Garland, Texas. She does a draw Muhammad contest or spins this thing up. I think a couple hundred people showed up and ISIS does put out uh, kind of a hit on her. And, uh, and two Muslims that have uh, that dedicated themselves to uh, to attack her, uh, they come from Arizona and they show up uh, to to go into this place and then kill her and everybody inside the the venue. Well, um, they hired somebody to do security, and the security person had out off-duty police officers, put them in concentric rings of protection, or put them put them in a layered approach. And there was a traffic cop, an older police officer, I think he was about to retire. He's out on the outer layer. He picks up something's not right. As they get out of the car, he sees they're armed, and he stops and kills both adversaries way away from the event and where all the assets were. So show you a quick news clip about this. So 
physical stop in the parking lot. If you're going to do any kind of stop, make sure it happens outside as far away from the asset as possible. Is saying very little about the officer who killed the gunman. But some of his colleagues are proudly telling Jeez, us. They killed the Q&A. About the but again, we want the psychological stop. But if you got to do a physical stop like this, do it in the parking lot as far away from the assets as possible. Hey, Steve, and of course a lot of people today are talking about that officer and his unbelievable marksmanship skills. The president of the Police Officers Association told that officer didn't do what he did. Hundreds of people would have died. The initial contact he put was nothing better than a hero. Officer Tim Franny isn't the only one describing his fellow officer as a hero after he single-handedly took down two fully armed men who police say were prepared to kill a lot of people. That training when we're given, when you Police use officer the street, has it a works. perfect flat to top. I wonder how long that took. To stop a threat. The traffic officer's name is not being released, but sources tell Fox 4 he's 60 years old, a 38-year veteran of the department, and had recently transitioned from motorcycle patrol to a squad car. He did what he was trying So this guy's 60 years old, and uh, there's an after-action report in a... Uh, and one of the police magazines came out a couple years, a uh, couple years ago. It was right after the attack. He talks about what happened. He gives an interview to this uh, police uh, publication about what he saw, and he says, "I'm no bad gunfighter. I'm out of SWAT guys. I'm a, I was, I've been in traffic cop for 20 plus years." And he's he's an older guy. He's like 60, uh, older now. This is this is a couple years ago. And he said, "Like I just saw something that didn't look right." And and so he's talking about he's far away from the asset on that outer ring, that outer layer, sees something that doesn't look right, like turns around to pay attention to it and then notices the guns and then is able to respond quickly and conduct that uh, physical stop in the parking lot. No one inside was harmed. All of this happened far away from them. So w the behavior and threat detection is about the psychological stop, but the cool thing about using some of these elements is even if it's going to be a physical stop, you're going to conduct that physical stop far away from the assets. So then let's talk about knowing your adversary. Look, you don't have to have you know some security expert come in and do this, but you do. If you've got a church security program, you do want to know what your uh, – who your adversaries are. What does that mean? Why are they adversaries? Where'd you get that information? Um, how are you collecting that? And once you collect it, you want to know, number one, what's their motivation? What's their objectives and, and their capabilities? Knowing your adversary is part of this process. Uh, you guys have asked ISC, I'll walk you through that when we start talking about the adversary attack methodology, those indicators to look for this. Okay, so you need to know who your, who your adversaries are. And you need to have a reason of why you believe they're your adversaries, because somebody in the leadership may ask that question. But you need to know their motivations, their objectives, and, of course, their capabilities. Um, remember, we start talking about active shooter now versus left-wing terrorism, some of the tactics we're seeing now, which are not – they're not physical attacks. They're like social attacks, public attacks. And the cool thing about this is even in Troy, New York, they conducted pre-attack surveillance before conducting that social attack. They, they went online. And the reason why they were there, there was, you know, one reason from what we understand, there's a gun giveaway at that church. So they went and did some research on the church, and they had to go there before and conduct pre-attack surveillance. Even though, again, this was not like a physical attack against the church, it was a social attack, right? So they're trying to get an audience, trying to get an overreaction. They still had to conduct that pre-attack surveillance, and this process works for both uh, you know, both the active shooter and what we're seeing today, right? So, again, that goal is to abolish religion. It is the uh, opium of the people, okay? The next element, threat validation. Now, let me kind of give you, when we start talking about field threat assessments, behavior-based -based threat identification processes have, number one, a low detection rate and a high false alarm rate, Okay? So if you pay attention to what TSA does, you're going to hear this or you read reports. And a lot of times the reason for this is because they're not getting enough indicators. So in behavior and threat detection, you've got to get a number of elements before I go up and conduct that field th a threat assessment. I don't care if somebody's printing. I don't care if somebody's have a, they've got a backpack on. I don't care if they've just been sitting out in the parking lot. There are multiple elements that I must see first before I decide to go up and conduct that field threat assessment. And that lowers that false positive rate, right? And that increases my ability to actually see an actual threat, 
okay? So you have to get multiple indicators based on different elements. It's not just one thing. It's not just two things. It's a, it's a number of elements you got to look at first. And they are based on, it's based on the environment because you got to know your environment. We talked about that. It's, it is based on behavior. It could be based on personal belongings that they've got with them. And it could be based on verbal responses uh, when you actually go up and talk to them. So it's based on a number of things. Next video I'm going to show you, I think I've showed this in probably one of our protection uh, uh, webinars. This is the Pope, okay? So he's shaking hands with folks. And so, you know, the folks like Mr. LaSorsa and Aaron Malden and, and, and Byron Rogers, uh, the folks that TGP all the time. And, you know, let me say about behavior and threat detection. So there are three very specialized skills in physical security. Uh, one is executive protection. Number two, this, behavioral threat detection is a second very specialized element in physical security. And the third is like knowing how to conduct a true risk assessment. Those are three very specific specialized skills in physical security that not every security person can do. Um, but like, you know, our friends in executive protection, if you go to their training, they'll talk about the advance. That pre-planning that is done before the principal of the protectee steps on site or has to go to that location. And there are different elements of the advance. One big element in an advance or conducting an advance is understanding who that audience is going to be and the way that they're supposed to act. It's behavioral and threat detection. It's just done in a snapshot risk assessment process, not a long term because they don't have time to do that. Okay? They're going to go do the advance. They're going to do what they need to do, try to get a snapshot threat assessment, go back, bring the principal or protectee back, and they're looking very quickly as they're trying to keep that protectee protected. Here, uh, it's the same process. We just have more time to deal with it because we already know our environment. Okay? Here's the Pope. So this is a case where I want you to just watch everybody in the crowd. So knowing the environment. So his protective team, I don't know if they just weren't paying attention, but if you'll notice, everybody in the crowd's happy. Everybody. Like they're smiling, they're taking pictures, they're, you know, they're reaching out to shake his hand, there's no problem. And then you're going to see a woman here just seconds left the screen, an Asian woman, and she looks different. Like she's very focused, she's not smiling. That would have been something maybe that someone would have saw based on behavior. And that wasn't picked up here, and it kind of made a big deal because the Pope, this woman was not really a physical threat, but something was different about the environment. Like, now I go from condition or or condition yellow to condition orange. So we've talked about that before in other webinars. That was something the protective team didn't pick up, and something happens, and it kind of gets undesirable for the Pope, and he kind of overreacted. But this is an example of, it's not just one thing, it's other things based on behavior that we need to be able to pick up and see, and that wasn't picked up here. So you can kind of see this here. Again, look to the left of the screen, you're going to see this woman. She looks very different. Her behavior is very different. Her, her uh, nonverbal uh, communication is very different. So some things that you learn in our behavioral uh, and threat detection process. So look, everybody's happy. I, you're excited now. Here she is. Now look at her, look at her hands. Look at uh, look. She's not smiling. She looks kind of anxious. So she's different than everybody else. Everybody else is happy. So she just wants to touch. She wants to grab him. But look, it it did. It turned into something aggressive. Okay. Turned into something very aggressive. If it was something, it was it was a change in behavior, where the protective team, if that's who that was didn't go into orange. I don't even know if they were in yellow. Maybe they're in white. Who knows? Okay. So uh, the next element, you must, which is the most important, at the end of the process, you have to make a decision. In, in uh, industry I was in for a long time, we call this access authorization. So we're authorizing someone come in, to come into our protected environment. In this case, when we talk about making a decision, it gets into a lot with church security teams. We're talking about legal requirements. We're talking about things like culture, like what's the culture in the church going to allow? Uh, and what I mean by that is like, you know, what, what's your process or procedure for doing this and deciding what are your procedures? But at some point, you got to say yes or no. So if you've gone through this process and you get to the point where you have to conduct the field threat assessment, so you've gotten all these indicators, you're going to go up and conduct your security interview, you have to make a decision. You're going to have to say yes or no. And the way it's like taught by the Israelis is, hey, are you going to put this person on an airplane? Because this is where this came from. That's what they ask you when you get trained. You know, that's kind of the kind of the, the kind of the concept that they talk about when you're being trained in this in this uh, uh, in this process. And so here, like if you've seen these indicators, you got to make a decision. Are you going to let this person in the sanctuary? Like here's what I saw. Now I got to make a decision. I got to live with it. I'm, you've seen this video probably half a dozen times. It is the Texas shooting. A decision was not made. 
a process wasn't in place. And don't get me wrong, I'm not blaming them. It's a volunteer security team, and it looks like, especially after with all the guns after this thing's over, the focus was on the gun. The focus was on the gun. Again, no blame to them, but a decision was it made. There were a lot of what we call, what the, the Israelis call BCIs, Behavioral and Contextual Indicators. They were popping up all over, and this guy had been to the church uh, numerous times. When he walked in that day, you'll see him. It looks like it's like this Jawa-looking thing from Star Wars sitting over here in the corner. He's let inside because a decision was not made, and a physical stop had to be conducted, not a psychological stop. And even if he decided to fight in the parking lot when they saw him, because they did see him, they saw him before he got in the sanctuary, but a decision was not made, and because a decision was not made, people were killed, and a physical stop had to be made, use of deadly force, which can, which can bring legal ramifications to the church and to the, and to the security team themselves. And as a security team member, you could get killed, and here a security team member does die. Okay. Again, I'm not blaming them. They didn't know. They didn't have the resources to do this, but it is a perfect case study for us to see. You must make a decision. You must determine a threat. There must be a process in determining that threat, especially in the house of worship. And then you got to psychologically impact them or stop them from coming in or tell them they can't come in. And if they don't like it, what's done in the parking lot or if it's done somewhere away from the assets, if the fight starts, it's away from those assets. Okay. All right, so he's sitting over here with this like fake beard on. He's got this hoodie on, and he also has got this weird, uh, you know, kind of uh, gait because he's 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 concealing a shotgun underneath that jacket. Okay, they knew something was going on. They're like giving handed arm signals when he gets up. They knew something was right. He comes out. He kills a security team member here, and then he kills, he kills, he kills the usher. And now all of a sudden, somebody made a shot. Somebody shot and killed him. But then there are guns everywhere. Everybody's got guns. Look, everybody. Guns pointed at everybody. It's like a muzzle circus. Guns everywhere. You know, I, I'm waiting for the clowns to come out of the car. There's guns everywhere. Listen, this was a horrible event. A horrible event. But this is a, and I, I'm not blaming them. They don't have the resources. They didn't know how to do it. But that's a psychological stop. Two people are killed, and then there's a bunch of safety if the issues afterward. Everybody, it's Texas. Everybody's got guns. Okay? And so... That last element, a decision must be made, and that's part of the process, okay? Hey, look, we're doing this over again in October, Behavioral and Threat Detection Module 1. That's going to be on Sunday, October the 11th. It is the most, most important training, Module 1 and, number two, and Module 2, that your church security team can, can, uh, can go to or attend, and we do it online. It's $60, okay? So, again, when we start talking about those elements, we have to know our environment. We have to know our adversary. We, know how, we need to know how to communicate. Uh, we have to um, use that layered approach. And, of course, uh, one of the most important things is we start talking about stops. We want to keep away from that, that physical stop. We want to keep it as a psychological stop. And we want to be able to do that by making a decision early. Okay? All right. Q&A. Anything, Scott? Any questions? Nothing? All right, folks. Thanks. 4:46. Whole thing was about 46 minutes, so we uh, we you know showed our processor what was going on for about 10, and then we tried to keep us at 30. So I hope we didn't keep you guys over. As always, thank you so much. Hey, listen. Last week we announced we we're going to kind of cut some of these free things off early. Uh, we're not going to do that. We're going to extend a little bit because uh, Scott and I had a discussion at lunch today. There are some uh, four specific topics we're going to continue with in October uh, that we just don't want to cut this off uh, for you guys. So we're going to keep on. We're going to keep this doing. We've got paint content in October coming up. A couple of them, you're going to see them, but we're going to continue to do this for a couple more Wednesdays because there's some topics after this weekend. we got some emails and some texts that we want to talk about. Uh, a friend of mine that's on a security team, running a security team south, uh, south of here, had asked me a, sp a specific question. He was like, hey, this will be something good for you to talk about because people don't know this. And so we are. We're going to build a series around it that will be provided for you guys for free. So this will continue for a little while. All right? All right, folks. Again, thanks for joining us. We appreciate your time and listening to me run my mouth for 47 minutes. Uh, Scott thanks you, Warren thanks you uh, if you're out there protecting your house of worship business, uh, your synagogue uh, your mosque, be careful we're thinking about you, if you have any questions email us or contact us at michaelmansecurityservices.com, you can get us at contact at michaelmansecurityservices.com or at scott m, s-c-o-t-t-m at michaelmansecurityservices.com and remember folks the most important thing and it fits along with this it's about prevention not response <laughs>